ready? All right, so we'll continue from where we left off in Perkevot, Perik Bet, Pas Mishnahi. We're still dealing with Hillel. He's the one that uh, discusses the various uh, Mishnayot. And he says as follows. Learning is very important. It is not only a mitzvah to learn. It is not only necessary for us to become knowledgeable in Torah so that we know how to conduct ourselves. Learning, especially Torah, does something to the individual. It refines his character. It contributes to his growth, his spiritual growth. We can't really do without the Torah. An individual, especially a Jew, loses out tremendously if he lives a life without learning. He may know the basics. Good. So Baruch Hashem, he'll know what to do, what not to do, the very basic, the very minimum. But that has nothing to do with learning. Learning in itself contributes so much, does so much for the individual that he does, one does not even realize what it does to him until a certain amount of time has transpired. And that is why certain individuals who, whose life involves work and only work, especially physical labor, will not really have the ability to sit down and learn too much. So that, that is why this statement is a very, very strong statement in a sense, that a bur cannot be a yerechet. Bur is also the description of a field when it's fallow. Fallow meaning it's barren, it's empty. It's not cultivated. Nothing is growing there. Right now it's pretty much useless. An individual who's a boor is an ignoramus. A person who's not cultured. He's a worker of the land. That's all he does, that's all he knows. He's not a bad person. He could be a nice, good gentleman, but he, it's not possible for this individual who's a boor, unlearned, totally unlearned, to be a yerechet, to be a God-fearing person. In order to be God-fearing, one has to learn. The learning will impress upon him what it means to observe the mitzvot, what Hashem is, you know, as, as far as we can understand what Hashem is. Learning can do so much to the individual, including increasing his yirat shamayim. Well, obviously, that's a very good thing for a person to have yirat shamayim, to be God-fearing. It will affect his way of life. It will affect his family. It will affect his conduct. It will affect so many things. So it can make a big difference. It can have a big impact in one's life if a person really has yirat shamayim or not. A person who's really God-fearing, really God-fearing, probably will never get into a major fight Hopefully not. He will avoid these kinds of things. He will hopefully not be jealous. He will hopefully not pursue illegal activities of all kinds. I mean, he's a yirechet. He's a God-fearing person. He's, he's concerned with sins. He's concerned with going against the, the Torah. This ability or this level cannot become about, one cannot get there unless one learns. Unless one learns Torah. Ma'aretz Hasid. Ma'aretz is a little bit more learned than the boor. He's just not as learned. Ma'aretz is a, is a person of the land. An average individual who's not a very learned person, but he knows a little bit. He did learn a little bit. He knows how to read. Maybe he knows how to pray. Maybe he can pick up a few halachot here and there. But he's still a Ma'aretz. He's not very knowledgeable. He does not know too much. This individual cannot become a Hasid. What's a Hasid? A Hasid means an individual who continuously works on his character, continually tries to better himself, to become a better person. So even though he may have some Yirat Het, he may be, of course, concerned about his, you know, his behavior. He, he may not do something totally wrong, but to, to be a better person, to refine his character, to grow, that is not necessarily something he's going to think about because there's nothing 
to motivate him to do that. For someone to want to be a Hasid, he has to be motivated. There must be a good reason for it. How is he going to receive that motivation if he doesn't learn? The learning, the learning of Musar especially, motivates people to change their ways, to be better people, not to be like the rest, like the average, to grow, to get closer to Hashem. Hasid is an individual who does lifnim meshurat adin, Rabbi tell us. In other words, he does not insist on having it his way. He sometimes is forgiving. He sometimes he basically overlooks uh, something that was done that was not so nice against him. He's able to overlook, he's able to deal with certain situations in a more uh, tender way, in a way that, does, is not, that others would, of course, react much more severely, and he's more tender, more easygoing about it, because he's a Hasid, which means he's an individual who has worked on himself. He's not just the average. He's not just reacting to situations. He's actually a little bit more in control of himself. His values are different than the average individual. So in order to have these values, these lofty values, in order for one to grow, be a better person, one needs to learn. So without learning, you can see that a person is not going to develop too much spiritually. Physically, we all develop. All you need is to eat a little bit of cereal every morning, have a banana in the afternoon, right? You have a little bit of dinner, and you grow, maybe to six foot eight, depending on your genes. That's physical growth. Spiritual growth, that requires a tremendous amount of effort to invest in uh, learning and in receiving guidance, of course, from the Chachamim, from the Tzadikim. And a person who's a, a boor, a person who's a amaretz, is not somebody that's going to be driven to that. Why should he? Why should he not be stubborn? He's stubborn. Why, sh why should he change that? What, what are the benefits of not being the way he is? He doesn't see. He, if a person does not learn, he cannot see the difference between how he was before and how he's after. You know, people who go on a diet because they're very obese, so they have pictures of them before and after, <laughs> right? This is the way they were before. This is the way. You see, you notice the difference. How did they get there? They made an effort. They obviously followed certain rules, and there's thousands of diets probably. And one of them worked for him, as long as he, of course, you know, he went by it. So you notice the difference. A person who learns Torah, really learns, is dedicated to learning Torah, with time, there will be a noticeable difference about him. So he then says, it's a chaval. Look what these people are missing. They cannot become yerechet. They cannot become hasid. They will never grow. And that is only because of a lack of learning Torah. These are not the only ones who don't learn. There is another individual who also will have a, a difficult time learning for a different reason. V'lo habayshan nomed one who's bashful. He's bashful, so he doesn't ask questions. He has doubts. He has a lack of clarity about a certain uh, topic, halachot, whatever it may be. And he's, uh, he's ashamed. He's, he, he doesn't know how to ask. He, he has a hard time asking. Musha, shame, bashfulness is a beautiful midah, but not when it comes to a class, not when it comes to learning Torah. The questions will bring out the clarity that we all need. So we need to ask. We need to, we need to clarify those things that are not so clear. That is what's done in, in, in any situation that uh, when one is trying to learn something. Right? If he has a lack of clarity, he will ask, hopefully, if there's somebody to ask. So if he's a Baishan, if he's a bashful person, you know, he may not do what it takes to, to find out, to figure out what the halakha is, what, what, this, what is, this particular pasuk means. And that's, and what a loss. In other words, just because of his busha, which is a good midah. It's a good midah usually for the most part almost everywhere. It's good for a person to be a bashful person, not an aggressive person. But when it comes to learning, you want to learn. In, in order to learn, you need to ask. Belo melamed. 
On the other hand, let's see the other side of the coin, the one who's a teacher. He will not be effective in teaching, in transmitting the Torah, if he is strict. He's a kapdan, strict, a very exacting, demanding person, perhaps a perfectionist. These people who are very difficult, in some way, difficult, they're not effective, they're not successful as teachers. Kapdanut is very similar to kaas. It is similar to anger. People who get angry when they're asked a question, people who are not tolerant of others, who do not have patience, and because of that, they, 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 don't, uh, they don't get along with, with everyone. You know, people don't want to you know, associate with these people. Well, just like they don't want to associate with these people, if you are the student in such a class, you won't be as receptive either to their words. So it's not only amongst friendships, it's also in a class, it's also in a husband and wife situation. I mean, it's in, it's a, it's in many, many kinds of situations where, where two individuals have some sort of relationship. You know, husband, wife, two friends, uh, teacher, student. When there's some connection, that connection will be weaker if the individual who's the giver, giving over, over the information, or the one expressing, making a request, husband or wife, is being very, very arrogant, angry about it, uh, strict about it. The rabbis tell us that, that the, well, actually, it's, it's a pasuk in Kohelet. Divrei chachamim benachat nishmaim. The words of the, of, the, of the chachamim, of the wise, are heard, are receptive, if they are given over benachat, if they're given over calmly. So the rabbis explain it, that if a person is going to be very, very tough, if he's not going to be patient with his students, if he's not going to be tolerant of their mistakes, then he won't succeed. Not only will he not succeed as a teacher, he will not succeed as, as a friend, as a husband, in all these situations. In other words, the, the tool, one of the tools, to, to effective communication, whether it's in the classroom or elsewhere, is to understand that not everyone is perfect, number one. Because of that, people make mistakes. And because of that, you want to be patient with them. And you want to be tolerant of their mistakes. Well, it would be a different world if people would be patient and tolerant, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. But many times, a lot of the, a lot of the hard feelings is as a result of lack of patience and lack of tolerance and lack of understanding that we're not perfect. And students, young children, what do you expect of them? That they should know it from the first time? There was one student who, who could not understand what the rabbi was teaching him only after the rabbi repeated it 400 times. Exactly. After the 400th time, the student understood it. You know what that means? The rabbi, of course, not only was a good teacher, he was a very patient teacher. And bischut, that he did not give up, but every single time, whenever was need, there was a need, he reviewed it 400 times. He lived to 400 years, from what I, from what I recall. Two options. They gave him two options. Yeah, you remember that, huh? Right, that's true. He got both. He got both, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so this is the way to do it. You know, not to be a kapdan, not to be strict. Otherwise, you won't be a good melamed. You won't be able to teach. You won't be able to communicate. Very, very important point in life in general. Not to be a strict person, not to be very demanding. Be easygoing, flexible, right? Girnade, right? <laughs> yeah, just so that's going to show me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Next point. Actually, before we go to the next point, uh, let's just go back a, to the point where we said before about learning. They say that Isaac Newton, you know, who was a very smart individual, a very uh, uh, knowledgeable person in many fields, 
and was somewhat of a scientist too in his time. He, his friend made fun of him when they discussed the topic of astrology. You believe in this nonsense? So Isaac Newton is reputed to have said, and I believe he said, I studied this matter, you did not. In other words, I have an opinion because I studied it. I may have an opinion. You cannot have an opinion. And if you do, it's worthless because you did not study the matter. If you would study something, you would know something about it. You would come to appreciate what, and, and see the true value of it, if it's there. But without studying, one does not see the value of anything. I mean, one does not appreciate life, the world, the cloud. That, that is why throughout Jewish literature, you find a tremendous emphasis on the chashivut, the importance of learning. Learning day and night, learning even if it's hard, learning till the last day of one's life, learning. learning. The Jew is always involved in learning. He doesn't stop, you don't retire from learning. You obviously want to learn from the right sources, not just from anyone. Next point, we have lo machim. We're continuing to talk about learning. So Hillel adds, and if somebody is too involved, too involved in schora, in business, it may not be so easy for him to be machim. Machim to become knowledgeable, to become smart. Lo kol machim. If a person is going to be too involved in his business, and the learning to him will be secondary or incidental, not something that is prime, of prime importance in his life, then because of that attitude, even if he learns a little bit here and there, that learning will not inspire him so much. It will not really make a dent in him as much. In order for the Torah to make a difference in one's life, then the Torah has to be nechshevet beinam. It has to be looked upon as, this is, for me, the most important thing in my life. When one is very, very involved in his business, he does not have the, the same constancy that is required for learning. For successful learning, you need a certain amount of time, you need constancy, and you need devotion. Right? You need misirut, you need the, the time, and you need, the, obviously, the, the constancy. So if that is lacking, and that could be easily lacking when somebody is very involved in his business, then how much would he be mahkim? So that's why he says, Lo kol amar be mahkim. It, He will not be able to acquire as much as if he would value it properly and be constant about it. Also, when a person is very, very busy with his uh, business affairs, he may have a lot of pressure, all kinds of uh, worries and concerns that come up. And these concerns and worries and, and, and issues will definitely interfere with his learning. To learn, one needs to be calm, focused. So all of these would, would hinder his progress in the learning. Doesn't mean a person should not work. He's not saying that. He's just saying that, obviously, if this is the most important, he's marbe. Marbe means that he, does, he goes more than the average. He works extra hours. You know, words, his attitude is that this is his life. Everything else is secondary. You know, obviously, that's not good, not healthy. We're not just talking about somebody who works a number of amount of hours. He learns a good number of hours of the day, and he's constant. But that's different. It's actually good to work. We, we talked about the benefits of work before. Here it is somebody that exaggerates, that works more than the necessary, and gives too much more importance to the work, and less so to Torah. Then with this attitude, with this kind of an approach to learning, the learning will not do too much for him. Very, very important point, this last point in this Mishnah. In a place where there are no Anashim, it doesn't mean in a place where there are no inhabitants. Here he means in a place where there are no individuals who are upright, who are doing things normally, right. They're all corrupt. 
They're all doing things not, not according to the Torah. In such a place, ishtadel liyotish. You be the one to be upright. Why, why is he telling this to us? Because we did hear before the words from him. Altifrosh minatzibur, if you remember last time. Don't separate yourself from the congregation, from the community. Don't be an outcast. Don't be different than everybody else. Be together with them. But that's on condition that they are good people. So here he comes back and tells you, in a place where there are no good people, in a place where people are not doing the right thing, it doesn't mean that you should do as the Romans say. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. No. You can be the good person. Imagine if everybody steals, if everybody's dishonest. You know, tell, they tell you sometimes, why don't you do this? He says, how could I do this? It's illegal. But everybody does it anyway. You see? Mm -hmm. So just because everybody does it anyway, does that mean you have to do that too? You be the good person. You be the honest person. But it's tempting. The Yitzhak says, why should I be in Israel? They, they would call you a friar. Why should you be a sucker? You know, everybody else is getting away with not paying taxes, and I have to pay my taxes. That's the right thing to do. What's the question? Right? So, in a place where there are no people that are doing the right thing, this is one, one interpretation. You at least make an effort to do the right thing. Now, it's also talking about a, a place where there may not be leadership. There may not be Tamidei Chachamim, Sofrim, Scribes, Mohel. There may not be the, these qualified peoples that are necessary for a community. Instead of saying, well, I'm going to leave. No. You be the one. You take the lead. What's the chidush here? What is he telling us? He's telling us because you might say to yourself, you know, it's not good to take a position of authority. We learned that before, to, to stay away from Rabbanut, from Srara, from, from th these kinds of positions. Too much politics. No, but there's nobody else. If there's nobody else, then you be the one. If you're qualified, if you're the only one and there's nobody else to take that position, the place is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna, is gonna to suffer as a result. They need you. So if it's such a place where they need you, then you'll be the one. But it's also important to, rem to keep in mind that when the, the makom is not behaving itself, then a person should not think twice to oppose that. Avraham Avinu is an example. Avraham Avinu, the Midrash says, is called Avraham Ha'ivri. Why is he called Avraham the Ivri? Because the whole world was on one side of the river, and he was on the other side, the Ever. The Ever means on the other side. So even if the whole world is opposed to you, so what? You continue to oppose them. You be on the other side. You don't have to be on their side. They're the majority. Makes no difference. It's a majority that is pasul. It's a majority that is doing the wrong thing. You can, it doesn't mean then you should join them. Yes, we, we want to go with the majority when the majority is doing the right thing, not when the majority is doing the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, think about it. Are you still going to, if you're an American citizen, are you going to vote for a, for the, for a president who's a Democrat just because you're part of the Democratic Party if you don't like the guy? You don't, you don't believe that he's the right person, that he's the qualified person. But you're a Democrat. Are you going to vote for him? No. You're going to switch parties. You're going to hopefully vote for the right man. But believe it or not, there are people that just go with the party, even though they know he's not good. How could you do that? It's not right. So we come Shein and Hashim. There are no good people. Don't think twice. Oppose them. Don't be like them. Don't think just because they're the majority that you have to go along their way. So Hillel is, is basically stressing over here is that even though people are not working on themselves, even though people may not be doing the right thing, it should not dissuade us in any way from not working on ourselves. We can be good people. We can be the better people. A person should not be discouraged just because nobody else is working, nobody else is doing it. Everybody speaks of Lashon Hara. Chaz Shalom. 
So just because they do, does, does that mean that you should not try to work on this midah? It has nothing to do. If people are not doing it, that should not hold you back from, from being who you should be, a better person. I saw another very interesting pirush, even though that's not a simple pirush, but it's also, there's also a lot of truth to it. A lot of times people behave themselves when they're in front of people. They see him. But when they're at home, or when they're by themselves, they, they, they just revert to their, to their real, the real self. Be a good person even if there are no people to see you, to observe what you're doing. Even then, in your own home, be a good person. Do the right thing. Just because nobody is watching doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. And obviously, this is, this is talking about hypocrisy, where people show one part of themselves, one side of themselves in public, and another side, the completely other side, when they are in their own quarters at home. Be consistent. Be always good. And now we've come to a very, very important Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, a very unusual Mishnah, a little bit difficult to comprehend, not your typical, a little bit, I would call it, if, if, if I may use the word esoteric. You know what esoteric means? It, it's a little bit mystical, what, what Hillel is about to tell us. But it's a very important Mishnah because it touches on Hashkafa and the proper Jewish outlook when one sees certain tragedies. Mishnah Vav. Af hu, Hillel, you know, meaning Hillel, af hu, ra'agul golet ha'chat shetzaf al p'nei He once upon a time saw a skull, skull of a human being, floating in the water. That's a very strange sight. Anybody know why that is so strange? Think about float. it. Floating. Yeah, floating on the, on the water, on the river. What? Right. Exactly. That could be one of the things that stands out over here that he just said, wait a minute, why is this skull floating? Okay? What's going on over here? Now, what's strange about it is that if it's, depending where he saw it, if it's the river or lake where it's fresh water, there is less buoyancy. In the ocean, for something to float in the ocean, it's easier than in a river or a lake. You understand that? Because of the salt? Yeah. So I'm assuming he saw it in the river or in the lake, not in the ocean. Because he was going by and he saw it floating. I guess. Not necessarily. Still, the fact that he saw it, right, is significant because he reacted to it. The Hasidut teaches that when we see something, it was meant for us to see it. We just didn't just saw something or just heard something. It was meant for us to hear it. It was meant for us to see it. There's obviously a reason for him to see it. Okay. But what's interesting is when he observed this skull floating, Amarla, he, he told her, he told her, you know, he was speaking to the skull, it's coming to you. Al de ataft at fuch. Because you, once upon a time, drowned somebody, that is why you drowned. And guess what? Those who drowned you, in the end, they will drown too, as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. So first of all, he's reacting to this call and saying, it's coming to you. In other words, this is, this is not just something by accident that happened to you. And second of all, don't worry. As far as the ones who killed you, they're going to get killed too. What's going on over here? <laughs> the simple, the, Im the immediate concept that we see here is the famous concept of midah keneged midah, measure for measure. That's, that's obvious. That's evident right away that that's what he's relating to here. That he sees somebody who drowned, and we know that everything is mishamayim, everything is bashgacha, everything is with divine supervision. Hashem is involved in what's happening in this world. And people don't just die. People don't just drown. There must be a reason for it. 
But what, what makes him so convinced that this individual is a wicked person? Maybe he was a victim. I mean, there are innocent victims, aren't there? Well, all the, every day we hear it. <laughs> In the news the other day, a guy was on the walk, sidewalk, with his, holding his baby, and somebody shot the baby, passing car. You know, all kinds of stories like this. So, what makes Hillel think that this guy is a Rasha? That he killed someone, and maybe he, was, he could have been a victim. It could have been, by the way, it could have been a victim. Easily, easily it could have been a victim that somebody just drowned him in the water. This man never killed, never drowned somebody, like he loved playing as he did. It's very possible. What makes he love believe that this man actually did drown someone? Yes? Because the body was floating for everybody to see. Otherwise, if he, if he was not a Russia, the body would have just gone to the bottom. Uh, the, it's uh, almost the same. Mind. Obviously, so that's why I gave you that introduction. The fact that he saw the, the skull floating tells him that this man was going through this bushot, this shame. And not only shame, his body did not come to a cavern. It was not buried yet they ever find it. That's not a good thing for a person to die and not be buried. No. So he had reason to believe that this man was in fact someone who had killed someone else. What else? There are other commentaries who explain that the, the fact that he let said it in the words that he said it. Amarla, he told her, <laughs> what is called, can't hear what you're saying. What do you mean Amarla? He actually knew this man who drowned. He knew him, and he knew that he was a Rotzeach, right? And somehow he went by and he saw this, and he says, yeah, yeah, listen. You did it to others, somebody did it to you. And that's Menashamayim, of course. So that's just another pirush. It doesn't necessarily have to be that he knew him. I still agree with you that the simple idea behind this is that he saw the circumstances here as such that basically are important lesson of not only midah kenege midah, but the fact that if a person goes through this kind of bushot, it's clear, Yad Hashem, to reveal it to everyone else that uh, he was not a victim, that he was a rasha. Why, why should the other ones then be punished? It's because you killed, because you drowned, you got drowned. The other ones who drowned you, they will be drowned too. Why should they be punished? He deserves it. Yes? It's in the same allegorical category of the roof, mm -hmm. the fence up. It doesn't have to be your house that the guy falls from. It doesn't have to be you necessarily to drown the guy. It has, he has to be drowned, but it doesn't necessarily have to be right. these individuals. Right. Well, the that's true. Yeah, but why are these individuals, why is he saying that those who drowned to you, mm -hmm. the ones who actually did, will be drowned? Because um, they are—they are also Russian, they, right? They are also individuals that have to be uh, uh, finished off, executed, killed. Right. But, uh, they don't necessarily have to kill this. Person. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Let me explain it a little. Yeah. You're pretty much saying the right thing. There is a mitzvah of ma'akeh. The one who has a roof where people walk on, if it's a place where people walk on, he should put up a parapet like a little fence around it. Why? So the Torah says, Ki pol The guy who will fall from it, will fall from it. But that doesn't make sense. The guy that will fall, will fall. Somebody may fall. No. A guy who's supposed to fall, the rabbis explain. He's supposed to fall anyway. But why should it happen in your house? Why should you be the one that carries out this terrible tragedy, or a tragedy, or atonement, whatever you want to call it. So you have to do the right thing, is to prevent tragedy from occurring in your premises. Put up a parapet. Rabbis tell us, Megalgelin zchut al yidei zakai v'chova al yidei chayav. Megalgelin means that HaKadosh Hu brings about a, a good deed through meritorious people. This is a good deed, a tremendous, a tremendous good deed that needs to be done. Who will do it? Somebody who deserves to do it. 
So he should get the credit for it. And if Hashem has to bring about a chova, a punishment of sorts, let it come through the hands of somebody who's chayav anyway. He's guilty anyway. So that's the case of where the Gemara says, Hashem brings the two together. He brings the person who is guilty and deserves the death penalty, but there's no witnesses for him to be executed in a, in, in, in a trial, in a betting. He brings him together at the same hotel at the same time with a guy who has murderous instincts. And as soon as he sees the guy, and the guy is uh, smiling at him the wrong way, he's going to be upset at him, and that's called road rage. <laughs> you heard of that? <laughs> yeah. Road rage. That's it. They put Hashem put him together. In other words, this guy would kill. Not that Hashem told him to. He has no right to. He has no right to kill him. What is he, an executioner for Betty? So he's doing a wrong thing. But it has to happen anyway, so Hashem says, let it happen through the hands of somebody who needs to die anyway. Through somebody who's guilty anyway. So of course, if he does it, he eventually will get killed. Yeah? What would be the reason for the innocent to draw? Well, I'm going to get there. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get there, sure. Okay. Now, what do we see? We see from here that Hillel is telling us that Hashgachat Hashem can be seen in many ways. The fact that this individual drowned and was floating, we determined that probably he deserved it because of what he did. But it could also be where, let's say, you wouldn't see the skull. It would, the guy drowned that he did not necessarily drown because somebody drowned him, because he drowned someone else. It's not, right? it's not set in stone. This example in the Mishnah was such. It don't, learn, don't infer from that that this is the rule everywhere. It could be that people will drown for other reasons too. Yeah. The rabbis tell us, for example, that Dalet mitot bed din, but lu, but not din dalet mitot. In other words, the four types of death penalties carried out through a bed din of Sanhedrin, right, are no longer applicable today. We don't have a Sanhedrin, right? No, nobody's put to, to death. There's no official death penalty through the hands of human beings, in other words, in the Jewish system. Not today. But that does not mean that just because we don't have the ability to carry out the death penalty, that the din of Arba Mitot, that the judgment for these four Mitot is non existent. It's existent. Hashem takes care of it. Instead of Sekila being thrown, down, thrown off a building, which is called stoning, but it's not really stoning, it could be a car accident, Hashem Ishmor, God forbid. Instead of Henek choking, it could be drowning which is equivalent to choking, asphyxiation. Instead of herig, which is like a guillotine, being taken off the head, it could be a person is shot, which is equivalent to it. And instead of serefa, which, which involves swallowing hot lead, which burns the intestines almost instantly, it could be a fire, smoke inhalation, electrocution, yeah. This is all Mishamayim. Everything is Mechushav. Everything is calculated exactly. So if that's the case, if somebody did drown, it's not necessarily that he was a murderer. It could be he was an innocent victim. But wait a minute. If that's the case, why does he deserve to drown? So, obviously nothing happens for no reason. There are additional cheshbonot, additional reasons of why people die. Not necessarily that they commit a crime. Now, what's one possibility? You should never place yourself in a dangerous situation. Very good. We're going to get to that. Very good. Yeah. That's going to be next. <laughs> but what I would like to say before that, which is really more, probably more, more, uh, common or, that, or the more typical explanation 
is that when you see people that appear to be completely innocent, especially children, you should know that it always, for the most part, has to do with a previous reincarnation. Okay? So Gilgul, Neshamot, is very, very much a part of, of, uh, of, of the explanation of why certain things happen to people who don't appear to have deserved this kind of a, an outcome. Children? Especially children. They're under the age of Bar Mitzvah. What did they do? Nothing. Right? <laughs> they misbehaved. Well, what, what does a child do already? Right? They yell too much. <laughs> Right? He's a little child. He's a two-year-old. What did the two-year-old do? Yeah, but this is a, you know, it's a painful topic to talk about. It's very sensitive. People don't like to hear that. But these are the facts. There is no other explanation. For the most part, this is it. There's no such a thing as something happening for no reason. But if we don't see the obviously the reason, especially when it's a child and the the Holocaust, which is a little bit of a different situation. Nevertheless, it's still a child. It has to somehow be connected to something. Yes? You made mention before about like, that beautiful story about Chavitz Chaim and his son doing the Brit Milk. Yeah, yeah, sure. That uh, when the, the son during the Brit Milk, like, they did the Brit Milk, and then the, right away that was, that, that was the Babasali. Was it the Babasali? Was that right. the Yeah, the Babasali. That was the, the Babasali that I recall, that he had a child from his youngest wife, I think it was, and at the Brit Milah, right after they did the Brit Milah, he died. Oh, and you can imagine, there was a pandemonium, and he was smiling. So when his assistant went to see why is he so calm and smiling, he told him, don't you understand? Baruch Hashem had a zechut to bring down in the Shema that was completely tzaddik, right? righteous. All she needed was a small tikkun. The tikkun was the Brit Milah. As soon as she got the Brit Milah, she didn't have reason to stay here anymore. I shouldn't be happy for that. You know? So he understood. He, most people don't know. And that is why most people, of course, are not going to smile. They're going to be sad. And the sadness is, by the way, part of a tikkun for them too, for the parents. We should never go through something like that. Chazam Shalom. It's, it's painful. It's hard. But... Atzur Tamim Paolo, Hashem is just. He knows what he's doing. So here, that's what we have over here. We have a situation where Gilgul definitely takes a, a, a great part in explaining why certain individuals who, who don't appear to have been guilty, on the contrary, they're innocent, simply victims, had to go through, had experienced something like that because it has to do with the previous lifetime. Now, there is, however, a big difference between the murderers who killed and got killed and the murderers who killed and died on their deathbed. What about them? How did they die on their deathbed? At the ripe age of 96. They killed the murderers. So the rabbis explain that there's a big difference between these two murderers. They're both guilty. One is worse than the other. And the one that's worse, for whatever reason, he will not get his punishment in Olam Azeh. He will only get it in Olam Abba. So for some reason, he may live a long life, for whatever reason. And since he is not killed, he doesn't have a kapara for his murderers. Because mita mechaperet, when a person eventually dies, as long as he did teshuvah, teshuvah in conjunction with the death, especially if it's a tragic death, serves as an atonement to him. When he comes up, he's happy. He's, he, he got rid of it down here below in this world. If a person is a murderer, if a person committed tremendous crime and he did not get what he deserves in this world, and he did not do Teshuvah either, then in Olam Abba, he's, he's going to have to pay for it. And if not in Olam Abba, in Yom Hadina Gadol Venorah, in Tchiyat HaMetim, 
In other words, eventually, he may lose everything. He may even lose his olam haba, depending on what he did. So there is a big difference between these two murderers. So a murderer who gets his death here, yes, we look at it as he got what he deserves, but not, don't only look at it as he got what he deserves. He actually is better off like that. Because in the end, Judaism is not a, a religion of punishing. It's all of atonement. It has to do with this is the, to the benefit of the individual. Of course, he deserves it. Of course, it's coming to him because of what he did. But the correct way to also look at it is that, in a sense, hopefully, if he did Teshuvah, he regrets. This will be his kapara too, as opposed to the one who doesn't, nothing happens to him, which is a possibility too for reasons that Hashem only know why Hashem is pushing around, protecting him, that nobody should hurt him. Hashem doesn't want him to receive the kapara. Or, for, or maybe he has some zechuyot that are protected. Who knows? All kinds of reasons. Some people ask, why was Paro punished? After all, Amisa had to go through Egypt and had to go through servitude, through a hard time. So Paro was carrying out the judgment of Hashem. So this is similar to what we said before, that Hashem brought them to Egypt into the hands of Paro who deserved, right, to, to experience the Makot. But that's just part of the explanation. The Ramban, I think, says that had Paro carried out the judgment of Hashem netto, without exaggerating, without being brutal about it, he would not have been punished. Had he done exactly what Hashem wanted of him to do, he wouldn't have been punished. But because he exaggerated, he overdid it. He killed little babies and threw them into, you know, into the Nile. He did things that he was not supposed to. He did more than what he was supposed to. And he did it in an evil way. That is why he's punished. So he's being punished for that which he did beyond what was asked of him to do. That's the reason. I want to just share with you three quick stories that are, are found in the Me'am Lo'ez. I saw them in the Me'am Lo'ez, as far as Midah Kenege Midah. And some of them we may have talked about in the past. Just it, it pays to review them because you can, you can see how the Ashgaha takes care of everything. Two friends, they were good friends. They went on a, on a long journey, a long trip. The two were very different. One saved money. He wasn't a big spender. He used to save everything. The other one was just the opposite. Whatever money he had, he spent. He wanted to enjoy life. Here they are by themselves, some remote location. And uh, the friend who was a spender decides, oh, this is my opportunity to kill the friend, the other friend, and to take away everything he's got. They were friends. And, but, the, but now, of course, the Yetzirah uh, took over. And he says, this is my opportunity. And he, he starts grabbing him. And he's about to kill him. And the friend tells him, don't do this. Don't you realize that eventually Hashem is going to get back at you and punish you and take revenge from you? He says, what are you talking about? There's nobody here. Nobody knows about it. He says, the rain that's, that's, that's dripping, the rain that's dripping, he says, will be a witness to what you're doing. So he started laughing from him. The rain that's dripping will be a witness. And he went ahead and killed him, took all his money. Anyway, this, the, one, the murderer went into a town that was nearby. And it was raining. <laughs> so he went to take cover from the rain. And he was saying to himself, he just remembered what his friend had said, the rain that's falling down, that's dripping down, will be the witness and will take revenge from you. So he began to laugh at the thought that he had, at what his friend had told him. In the meantime, as he's laughing, the king was passing by. This king had a habit that he used to go through the streets incognito. You know what that means? 
He dressed up in a way that he didn't want people to recognize him and to just see what's going on. And whoever would recognize him, he would kill. <laughs> that, that, that's what he did. So here he, he comes, he approaches the guy who's underneath the cover, and he sees him laughing. He says, you're laughing, huh? Because you recognize me, huh? <laughs> so, so he immediately went to hang him. So, so the, this guy didn't know what's going on. He says, why are, you, why are you killing me? He says, because I saw you laughing at me. Because you recognize. He says, no, 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 no. That's not, how I, that's not what I was laughing. That's not what you were laughing. So tell me why we are laughing. And I says, oh, no. If I'm going to tell him no matter what I'm doing, well, no matter what I do, I'm doomed. I might as well tell him. So he tells him the story how he told his friend, uh, you know, how his friend told him that the, the rain will, will take revenge from you, you know, and, I, and, and of course I, I made fun of it, and here I'm, the rain is coming down, I'm saying, oh, I'm wondering if that's going to happen. And I was laughing at it because I didn't believe in it. And that's when you came through. He says, really? Take me to the spot where you killed him. And of course the, uh, the king brought the family, of this man who had, who had been killed. He made the guy return them the money, and he eventually hanged the guy for doing what he did. So in the end, he got what he, what's coming to him. You know, he thought there's no witnesses. Yeah, Shammai, they see everything. The other story was with a, with, and there's a similar story somewhere else. This, this one is a quite, actually quite similar to another one where the king was very good friend with the Jew, the Jewish doctor. And the bishop was an anti-Semitic bishop who hated this Jewish doctor. And he always tried to convince the king to get rid of him. And the king did not want to get rid of him. You know, he's a good Jew, he's a good doctor, he's a good man. This king had an only daughter who he loved very, very much. So the bishop decided he's going to talk to the daughter. And he tells the daughter, listen, tell your father to get rid of him. Okay. Since the bishop was teaching her and taking care of her, she listened to the bishop and told her to the king. The king says, you know, I love you, my daughter, but I, he's a good man. I don't know, just want to get rid of him. Why, why, why get rid of him? He's a good man. So the bishop decided on another tactic. He told the daughter to make herself sick, to make believe she's very, very sick and she's going to die, unless he, he throws him out. So the, doc, so the king sees how she is, and she, the only way that she's going to feel better if if the, if, if, she, if the king, her fulf father fulfills her wish of throwing him out, and he had a very hard time until he had no choice. And he said, okay. So he told the, he told the, king, the, the, the doctor not to come anymore to the palace. But that was not enough. Apparently the bishop was very upset that this man was still alive, and he decided to tell the, doc the, the daughter, you have to tell him now to kill this person, because he's a threat, or whatever. So she finally tells her daddy that she had a dream. A terrible dream, a terrible dream that she's going to die unless her father does what she needs him to do. So the, the king says, I can't just do anything you want. Says, but, she, but I'm going to die otherwise. So he finally agreed whatever she says. So she says, well, they told me in the dream that this doctor has to be put to death. Otherwise, you know, she's going to die. And he believed her. You know. So what does he do? He tells the doctor, I, tomorrow, I want you to come at 9 o'clock exactly to this spot. That spot was where, where the, it was a big furnace. It was a big furnace. And I want you to, uh, to check out what's going on over there. And to ask the guy if everything that the king had said was taken care of. He's the king is a good friend of him. He says, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll be there at 9 o'clock sharply. And the king, of course, intended him to be thrown into the furnace as soon as he approached. That's what he made up with the guy who was in charge. The morning came, the, the, the doctor, the Jewish doctor, was on his way, and a young Jewish boy stopped him. Please come and help. My mother is very, very, very sick. If you don't come and help her, she's going to die. I'm sorry, I have to take care of the king's wishes first. I won't let you go. You don't understand. If she dies, we'll all be orphans. So I put a little bit more pressure on him. He says, no, but I'm, 
I have to go. The, the king is waiting for me. And I'll come back a little bit later. You know, so he says, no, but you, I'm telling you, she's going to die if you don't come now. Why is your life more important than her life? You know, he, he really gave it to him. So the, the doctor realized that he, that there was some truth in what he was saying. You know, this is a very important too. Sakanat nefashot. So he decided to go to the mother to take care of her. Some time went by, and, and afterwards he immediately ran to the spot. But before he got there, the, the bishop went to see if at 9 o'clock the doctor was thrown into the furnace. So he comes to check at 9.05, 9.10. So everything is okay, we'll take care of what the king asked you to do. So he threw the bishop into the furnace. <laughs> Yeah. So when, the, when the, the doctor finally came and he was approaching the place, the, 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 he saw the king crying. And all of a sudden, the king sees him and he says, why are you crying? And what are you doing here? You know? <laughs> so they were shocked at each other. And finally, they understood what had happened, that the bishop was behind the whole thing. And he's the one that intended to kill him. And instead, he got killed. You see? Here he did not even kill, he intended to kill and he got killed. Third story was that there was a, a poor woman, a widow, in the edge of town who people would come by and, and would help her, would give her tzedakah. But she had a very strange uh, comment to make every time people helped her. She would basically say, Whatever you give me is for your benefit, for your good. In other words, it's not for me. So one time, a duchess, a, you know what a duchess is, a, a very important uh, woman uh, came to her and, and helped her. And she said the same thing. Now, what did the duchess do? The duchess brought her, instead of money this time, she brought her a cake she baked for her. So every time she brought her money, and now, she, she brought her cake, she still said the same thing. But this time, the Duchess was upset when the woman told her, whatever you do is for your own good, for your own benefit, not for me. So the Duchess was upset, what do you mean for my good? It's for your good. No, whatever you do, it's ultimately for you. It's, ulti it's ultimately for you, not for me. So she decided that in this cake, she's going to put poison. She's going to be poison. What do you mean it's for me? It's ultimately for you, not for me. So she put poison in the cake. And uh, the woman was so impressed by the cake that she put it away. She didn't want to eat it. It was such a nice cake. A couple days later, it happened to be that through that part of town, the Duchess' son was coming by. He was traveling. And he was very, very hungry. And he stopped off at this little hut. And she greeted him and she says, oh, I have something for you to eat and to drink and to you know, rest a little bit. She gave him a little piece of the cake and the guy died. So when they, they went to call the Duchess, the Duchess says, now I understand what she was saying, the old lady was true. Whatever you do is ultimately going to come back at you. It's ultimately for you. In other words, if you do something good, it comes back to you as good. If you do something bad, it comes back to you as well. Whatever you do, it's for you. You understand the idea? It's ultimately coming back to you, one way or another. So here she, she took it in the wrong way, the Duchess. But in reality, this was a very, very important idea that she was telling her. Of course she was helping her. But whatever you do is ultimately coming back to you. If, if you had done something good, it would come back as good. But you did something bad, and something bad come back. So it's ultimately whatever you do to others, it's coming back. It's coming back either as good or chaz shalom not, depending on what you did. Anyway, as you pointed out before, when it comes to dangerous situations, running river, don't take a chance. Don't try to run across it. Don't think you, you, you know how to swim. A person should not put himself in dangerous way because he may not have zechuyot to protect him. And even if he does, if, if he uses his merits to save his life, then they deduct from his merits upstairs. So you don't want to put yourself in a dangerous situation because it's true that at times, if a person, if a person does the wrong things, he can hurt his health. 
people who smoked, they were supposed to live to 88. But they chopped, 20 years came off because they smoked themselves to death. That's, that's a mini suicide. They have to maybe come back. They, they were supposed to be here 20 more years. Right? A person cannot do this to himself. You have to watch your health. So do not take a risk. Do not put yourself in danger. And a soldier has no choice. He may walk up on, on, on top of a mine, Hashem Yishmor. He may run, he may run in, in harm's way. And as they say in Israel, every bullet has a tov, it has an address. It's Mishamayim. But nevertheless, it's a Makom Sakana. And what anybody goes into a Makom Sakana, regardless of the reasons, in a dangerous place, he just may not make it. That, that's why the Zohar says, if a human being is holding you up, a thief, Give him the money. Because a human being has free will. He's not necessarily a messenger of Mishamayim at that point, at that moment. If he's a carjacker, a thief, assaulting you, and he pulls the trigger, it may not have been the time to go to leave this world. But you were, he's a Bal Bechira. An animal, a snake, a scorpion, their shlichim, complete shlichim, unless you step on them intentionally and bother them. But a Bal Bechira, a human being, you have to be very careful because you, you, you're playing with fire. Russian roulette, same thing. You're, you, don't take a chance because you may not have enough of a school to be protected and, and for him to, to, to the trigger to be jammed. People have had miracles, the trigger was jammed. But don't expect that because he's a Bal Bechina. He's not necessarily a messenger of Therefore, don't put yourself in a dangerous situation. Yeah? There is an element of luck involved then. As a, you know, if you're involving someone that's using their free will to harm you. So what do you mean luck? You're saying... In other words, he has free will. And that free will sometimes allows him to carry out something that necess is not necessarily coming to you. You're playing with your life. In other words, you give him the money. Don't say, oh... Hashem will protect me. No, not necessarily. You may not have that kind of a zechut. Okay, you give him the money and he still, as Hashem, he does something. No, then, then that and could then that could that be was mishamayim. It was decreed that way. Okay. Exactly. But if you played with it, you know, try to to hit him or try to refuse, you're taking a chance. Yeah. Rabbi, is someone allowed to place themselves in a dangerous situation to do a bit? No. Say, for instance, you, you can't save somebody's. You can't try to save somebody's life if your life is going to be in danger. No. You're walking down the street. Yeah. You look up. You see a bird's nest. In a right. Tree. Right. You bring a ladder. Right. It's dangerous. You're going to climb up the tree. Why is it dangerous? It's not dangerous. It is dangerous. No, a ladder is not dangerous unless it's a sulam ra'oa, unless it's a it's a it's, it's shaking. If it's a if it's a good ladder and you place it well, you know it's it's it's, it's, it's you know it's a double ladder or against the wall, or in a perfectly good place, uh, there's no reason for you to suspect that something will happen. Why should it? Even if the person is going... You're not going up Mount Everest, no, where no, you're going gonna, gonna to run, gonna run out of oxygen, no, no. and you may up, slip in the snow. He's going up 20 feet. He's going up... You know, people do that every day when they go fix roofs. What are the st st statistics? The st you, you have to look at statistics to be able to figure if something is dangerous or not. A lot of people would consider that thing? No, 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 no. Not, not going up. Uh, if you're going up, to, if you're climbing a, a building from the outside, <laughs> maybe. Things can go wrong. Here, things can go wrong. But things can go wrong even if you're crossing the street. A car may come and not stop because his brakes failed. But do you understand that some people consider that to be dead? So there's an element of danger. Only if the person, the only time I would not recommend somebody go up a ladder 20 feet or go up to the roof, if he has a heart condition, he's an older person, he's not physically fit, it's a, it's a, it's a very windy day, right? Or, the, or the, the ladder is not good. The ladder is not a good ladder. The, 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 the floor is not level. Imagine somebody doing this, taking a ladder and putting it on the chair because it's not high enough. So he puts it in a chair on, on this table. He puts a ladder on this table. He, I don't think he's too smart. <laughs> right? <laughs> but a normal ladder is not a problem. Yeah. Actually, he himself thinks it's a dangerous thing to do. 
What? If he himself thinks it's a dangerous thing to do, go up to another 20 feet, then it's a second for him, you should not. Oh, for him too, if he thinks that way, yeah. Yeah, some people are afraid of heights. Yeah. For the normal person, a 20 foot ladder is not a big deal. Well, would he be protected by the mitzvah? Not necessarily. Not always. No, that's the famous uh, story yeah, in the Gemara with the, with the, the young boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most, usually, a person that goes to perform a mitzvah has some some degree of protection, but it's not a guarantee. It all depends on what his history is like. If he has a bad history, if there was something on his record, a blemish, not a good record, like in that boy's, there was some blemish, then the the protection was gone. Understand? So, so protection can be gone for. Doing having done something wrong. Yeah, yes? But Abraham went with the Eshai. So he was going to miss one. When he came back, his wife was passed. Sarah was like, Sarah's time came. Sarah came. Her so time it, came. It, it has nothing to do with each With other. his going? No, no. Sarah's time, her time came to go. Even though Abraham was doing mitzvot. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, exactly. But this mitzvot has nothing to do with the No, no, no. no. Let's just finish with an important point that this topic of death, of tragedies, of sudden things that happen to people that we don't have too much clarity, we don't fully understand, is obviously uh, something beyond us. And it's Tarot Lashem Elokeinu. We don't really fully comprehend anything in detail. We have general guidelines that we're told that any Surim Beliavon, that there's no such thing as suffering without some sin. But we don't, it's better not to point and say that this is because of that, because of that, because we don't really have an understanding. We just say Hashem knows what He's doing. The best mashal, perhaps, to describe this is going into a tailor's shop and seeing him using his scissors to cut up a beautiful wool cloth. A nice three, five, six yards of blue. He's cutting it up. And he's cutting pieces, cutting like this, cutting like this, cutting like this, cutting all over the place, pieces. What a shame, you're saying this beautiful roll of wool is being cut up into pieces. What's going on? You come back the next day or two days or a week later and you see what he did with the pieces. This became the sleeve, this became the jacket, this became the collar, and you have a beautiful suit that he has made from all the pieces that he has cut. Hashem is cutting. Hashem is doing all kinds of things and we see pieces and we can't understand what these pieces are. In the end, we will see, when Mashiach comes, we will understand that all that He has done is for our good. Amen. Amen. Amen.